In previous lessons, we learned about two of the pillars of the cell theory, that all living things are composed of cells or exist as a single cell. So plants and animals are multi-celled, and then there are lots of other single-celled organisms on planet Earth. And we also learned that cells are the basic unit of life. A cell is the smallest living thing. So if we take our cartoon down here, here we have a cell, and what we have learned is that cells are performing complex chemical reactions in the fluid within the membrane boundary. That chemistry requires a constant supply of nutrients and energy. Proteins are going to be the key players that are going to be doing lots of these chemical reactions, and the cell has a DNA molecule that is the recipes to build the proteins. The result of this chemistry will be waste materials that must be eliminated from the cell. So life is a chemical process happening within this membrane boundary. And importantly, while the whole cell is alive, none of the molecular parts is alive. So proteins are not alive, DNA is not alive, etc. The molecules that make up the cell membrane are not alive. In this uh, final lesson, then, we'll answer the question, where did cells come from? And that will be our third pillar in what has come to be known as the cell theory. The question of cell origins was, of course, important if, if one wanted to understand animal development or plant development. After all, if we start with one cell and we end up with a baby that has trillions of cells, we have a puzzle there. Where did all these cells come from? Where did brain cells come from? Where did the cheek cells, the lung cells, the muscle cells, the blood cells, where did they all come from if we're starting from one cell? Now, at the time in the 1800s, there are a lot of people who did not agree with Dutrochet, who, remember, argued that there's important chemistry going on in the fluid of the cell, and that chemistry is what gives rise to life, that the cell is alive because of the chemistry going on inside the cell. Well, there are a lot of doubters about that. What was known at the time about chemistry was very rudimentary, and so a lot of people did not believe that chemistry could explain life. And as a consequence, they, they went for a different explanation, that there was some kind of force in nature, like a vital force that was responsible for creating life inside the boundaries of the cell. Now, what was the nature of this vital force? Uh, nobody had uh, lots of details about that, but they speculated that there must be something else besides just chemistry that was responsible for life. So when we apply these ideas to the case of animal development, there were lots of folks who argued that new cells emerge from the fluid. Some thought the fluid inside the cell. Some believed the fluid outside the cell could make new cells. Some believed new cell formation was kind of like crystallization. And there were lots who believed that this was a case of spontaneous generation. A vital force in nature had the power to stir up non-living materials to make new living cells. Well, in the mid-1800s, with better microscopes, people like Robert Remack uh, was patiently observing the eggs of frogs, and he witnessed directly with his own eyes, after hours of observation, one cell dividing into two cells. And those two cells would later go on to divide into four cells. So Remack and others were witnessing directly evidence that new cells emerge from pre-existing cells, that one cell can divide to make two daughter cells, and these two daughter cells can go on to divide to make four cells, etc. Let's see what this might have looked like under a microscope. Here we see a, the egg of a sea urchin, and we have these little tiny cells here are sperm cells. So this egg will be fertilized by one of the sperm cells and a membrane will arise to block entry of other sperm cells. But then we'll, we'll cut to what happens to this cell and it's going to undergo its first division to form two cells of the embryo. So here we see fertilization has happened and this clear membrane arises around the entire egg to block entry of a second sperm cell. There, the, that one got in. So this is the moment of conception, as it were, of a sea urchin. Now in the 1800s, uh, scientists were work, working with frog eggs, but they witnessed much of what you see here. 
this is speeded up and you're witnessing the fertilized egg undergoing its first cell division to form the two cell embryo. And here we see a four cell embryo. So it was this kind of evidence that suggested that cells are not spontaneously generating from the fluid in the, in the body of a, of a mammal or in the ocean. Rather, cells are coming from other cells. Cells have the capacity to create new cells. But that's not spontaneous generation. That's life coming from life. Cells come from pre-existing cells. So cell number increases during development because of cell division. The cells of an animal came from pre-existing cells. And this was true of plants as well. So plants are multicellular. We have leaf cells and root cells, but they all derive their existence from the original seed. So a single cell goes through multiple rounds of division to make more and more cells. And then uh, through a process we'll study later, these cells specialize into different kinds of cells, leaf cells and root cells. But the key point here is that cells of a plant come from pre-existing cells. Now Rudolf Virchow is uh, mostly given credit for nailing this last pillar of the cell theory down where the argument is that cells come from other cells. So he collected evidence from lots of other scientists and forcefully persuaded others that in fact there is no spontaneous generation. Cells have the capacity to make new cells. A later scientist once wrote, the dream of every cell is to become two cells. Now, if you're a single-celled organism like Paramecia, the dream of every cell is to become two cells. Well, that's just reproduction. So here we're going to play this film here. We've got some Paramecia up here in the top of the uh, screen here. And this one here is in the process of reproducing. So the parent cell is going to split into two daughter cells. This is how single-celled organisms reproduce, just by cell division. Virchow went on to uh, consider the roots of disease. So uh, in his mind, cells were not just structural features of an organism. They were actors, doers, workers, builders, creators. And being these active participants in constructing an animal, if something went wrong, if cells started to malfunction, then perhaps this was the, the, the explanation for disease in the body. So because cells had different kinds of jobs, this might explain why there are different kinds of diseases. Perhaps diseases are the result of cell dysfunction and if different types of cells malfunction, then you would uh, expect different kinds of malfunctions of the resulting tissues and organs. Um, Verschau wrote, Every pathological disturbance, every therapeutic effect finds its ultimate explanation only when it's possible to designate the specific living cellular elements involved. So if brain cells malfunction, you're going to have symptoms involved in your, your cognition or your memory or your senses. Uh, if lung cells malfunction, you're going to have trouble breathing. If muscle cells malfunction, you're going to have trouble moving. If blood cells malfunction, you'll have trouble getting oxygen to the rest of your body, etc. So Virchow helped us understand disease being rooted in cellular function. When cells are performing their jobs and they're doing their jobs well, we have health. We have the condition of health. When cells malfunction, we have disease and ultimately death. So we've arrived then at the three pillars of the cell theory. All living things are composed of cells or exist as a single cell. Cells are the basic unit of life. A cell is the smallest living thing. And cells come from other cells. 
they do not spontaneously generate. And Virchow added on this connection to medicine that functional cells cause health and dysfunctional cells cause disease and ultimately death.